part of this program, part of what my thesis supervisor wants to know is how well I can do at teaching a class. And so he wants to know if, if we can take a group of people and increase their knowledge by my teaching. And so the way we're going to do that, the way we're going to determine that is by a survey. And so we'll do an initial survey, and this gives us a baseline, a place to start. This is not testing you, it's testing me. And so we start with this baseline, and then when the classes are finished 12 or 13 weeks from now, we'll fill out another survey that's essentially the same thing, the same questions. There's some that are different, but most of them are the same. And you'll answer those questions, and then I'll have something to compare the before and the after, and, and then I'll look at a bunch of statistical data to see if, if truly I was able to teach you anything or not. And so, like I said, this is a, a reflection on me. It's not a reflection on, upon you. So we'll do that first off. Uh, and so if you'll look at the back cover of your uh, notebook, on the inside back cover, there's a survey in there. We'll go through that real quick. I want you to notice that it's anonymous. I'm asking for your last three digits of your social security number, and the only reason I ask for that is I have to have some way to compare your initial reading, your initial survey with your final survey. I've got to be able to pair those up. And so if you'll do that, please don't put your name on it. I don't want to know uh, who filled out what. So, uh, so it needs to be anonymous. There's an agreement to participate, and by your turning that back into me, you have basically given me consent to use your research information and the information in these questions as part of my research work. Like I said, it's all anonymous. Uh, no one at my seminary will know what you say or what you put in the survey. I won't know, so it'll be completely an anonymous. So with that said, I, I ask you to be to be honest, to be accurate. The more honest and accurate you can be, the, the better this will be for all of us, uh, especially for me. Um, one thing I did want to point out is this is an initial survey, and the scale takes some time to read it before you begin, but the scale goes from one, one to six. And it's based after a very popular statistical scale called a Likert scale. And it seems odd to go from one to six, but that's the way this particular Likert scale works. Well, so these are basically a series of statements, and there's the first two sections are statements, then the last section is yes or no. But in these first two sections, there's a statement, and the first one is a statement like, Christian apologetics and the defense of a Christian faith is commanded in Scripture. And so you read that, and if you strongly agree with that statement, you would put a six. If you strongly disagree, you would put a one. But, but I want to I want to mention this for you to consider. If you go down through this and you list a six, like you strongly agree with all of these comments, and then we go through 12 or 13 weeks of class, and we get to the end and you take the survey again, there's nowhere for you to go but down. So you might think about that as you're doing this initial survey. If you put all six, all sixes on all the questions, there's no place to improve. So I'm not trying to coach you to score low and then score high. That's not what I'm trying to do. But you need to give some thought to that about, you know, if I plan to learn something, I may want to start out at a lower number and then move my way up. So if you'll just go through the questions, like I said, it's anonymous. We'll, we'll fill those out. I uh, give you 10 minutes or so. Anybody have any questions before we get started on those? If you choose not to participate, if you want to just sit in the class and not be part of the survey, then just don't fill it out and don't, don't turn it in. Uh, but I would appreciate it if you would. So uh, I'll give you about 10 minutes to fill that out, and then we'll, then we'll begin with an introduction to the, to the class. If you would take those and turn them face down, and then pass them toward the center aisle. And then each person on the center aisle, if you would pass them to the person in front of you, they'll make their way up to the front that way. If you need just a few more minutes, go ahead. I can get it from you after class if you want to hang on to it for just a few more minutes. But we'll go ahead and get those. Oh, 
All right, so we'll go ahead and get started for what's going to be the next 12 or 13 weeks. We're going to study about apologetics. I've built these notebooks to help you keep track of the material that's, that'll be handed out each week or every other week as we work through, work through this material. At, at the start of it, there's some front material here that I'd like to go through with you just real quickly. There's a blank cover sheet, all these Notebooks look the same. I'd encourage you to write your name on it. This is your notebook to take home. Uh, so if, if you leave it here, I, I can't promise what will happen. In fact, the ones that are left on the tables, I'll, I'll put back in the box. Some of our teachers need them. And there will also be uh, uh, some people that missed this morning that will need a notebook next week. So if you leave, it, you leave your notebook here, it's going to get picked up. But if you'd bring it with you each week, uh, that would be great. I've got a contact list there, and I was informed this morning that there's an error on the contact list, so I'll print a new copy of that and distribute that to you next week. So take care of that. The, the next sheet is just some general title information. And then there's a section on uh, that's just general information, and I won't go through all of this because I'll cover part of it in the presentation, but I do want to uh, speak for a minute about number four. This class is a progressive class. It's a, cu a cumulative case for apologetics, and so it builds week after week after week. And since it builds week after week, there is a... A minimum number of classes that have to be attended uh, for me to be able to use your data. You can miss all you want, but for me to be able to use your survey data, uh, each person has to attend at least 12 out of the 13 sessions, or they have to listen to the recordings that Jacob's going to post on the website. That's also in your contact list information is the church website, and each week There'll be a link on that website you click on. The video of this will, will pop up. Jacob's recording all of this. And so the, the video will pop up and you'll be able to uh, take the class, so to speak, if you miss or if you're at home. This is how most of the uh, Sunday school teachers are participating. They're actually going to take the survey and they'll watch all of their classes online. Then they'll take the final survey and, and of course, I'll be able to use their data that way. And so, um, like I say, if you, if you, on the last survey at the top, it says, how many of the classes did you attend? And if you attend less than 12, I won't be able to use any of your data. So, so I encourage you to, to go on and, if you miss, to go on and watch, uh, watch the videos as a makeup. So. So, guys... Uh, that's the, the reason I would like for you
Starting at number seven, and I'll cover this again in just down below anything that man's created or anything that man has written uh, it's 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 supreme over everything and i want you to know that i acknowledge that and we will end up with that as i said this is a cumulative case and we have a start and, a, and an end it starts with god and it ends with god and all along the way we're going to be working toward that and as we get into this, hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about where we're going. So, you'll start in your outline, and your outline is just a rough following. Uh, there's room there to take notes if you'd like. If you have any questions, you know, ask me later, uh, preferably after class. I'll stay here as long as you need to talk. Uh, you can text me, you can email me, uh, you can call me, you can do anything you need to do to reach out to me if you have any questions or want to talk about something or, or uh, need some more explanation on something. So so please don't take something I say, not understand it or disagree with it or be mad about it and just hold that in. That's not good for you and it's not good for me either. So if you please just let me know if, if there's something that's, that's bothering you or you need some more information on something, uh, please let me know about that. So I appreciate you taking the survey. One last thing, we were going to roll the high school class into here. I don't, is there anyone under 18 in this school? All right. I will need uh, a parental consent, and we'll, we'll take care of that after class. So uh, to just sign a paper that your parents are, uh, are free to let you participate in the class. So I'll have to have that. So. see the world in a very particular way. Hey, Jacob, you can catch those lights over there too. Yeah. Does that help? Christians see the world in a particular way. So do the atheists, so do the naturalists and the, the materialists, so do the Buddhists and the Hindus. They all see the world in a particular way. How people see the world is called their worldview. We as Christians have a Christian worldview. An atheist has an atheistic worldview, and they look at the world in a different way. They screen everything in the world different than we do. And it ultimately comes down to what I've talked about before. It comes down to the, the uh, three big questions. And I preach on this if you recall. The three big questions in life. How did I get here? What is my purpose in life? And where am I going? These are the three big ultimate questions in life. And every worldview answers, provides answers for those questions. And depending upon the worldview, they answer those questions in completely different ways. And all people... that worldview to answer these particular questions. But maybe this will help you. This is a, a, a quick little chart to refer to. I call it the big three. So these are the big three questions and just very generally this is how Christians answer those questions. How did I get here? It was created by God. What is my purpose? Reconciliation with God. And where am I going? I'm either going to heaven or hell. The atheist answers those questions completely different. How did I get here? 
they say I got here by blind evolution. Just, I just happened to come up out of a soupy pond of water. What's my purpose in life? They're like the Epicureans. They say it's self-gratification. Pray for tomorrow we die. And where am I going? Most atheists and naturalists believe in what's called annihilation. They believe that you just die and you turn back into dirt, and that's the end of it. There's no, there's no afterlife at all. And so you can take this chart and you can plot it on out for every worldview. You could come along here and you could say a Buddhist worldview, and they would answer those different. You know, a, a materialist, a person that believes there's nothing in the world but material things, would answer that different. A naturalist, a Darwinist, would answer those questions different. And so that is how worldviews work and how we use worldviews. And apologetics is a tool that we use to compare worldviews. How do we look at the Christian worldview and we compare that to the atheist worldview? That's what we're doing. We're trying to compare these two worldviews. And then as Christians, we're trying to say, look, your worldview is false. It can't answer those questions. Only the Christian worldview can properly answer those questions. And we have lots of reasons, lots of evidence and reasons that we answer those questions the way we do. The other thing about worldviews is if it's a false worldview, it is filled with contradictions. And most false worldviews steal from Christianity. We'll get into that when we get into what we call the moral argument. You know, the atheist have no ground to stand on for morality, so they steal morality from Christianity and use it as their own. They cry foul and won't have a moral standard, but their worldview doesn't have a moral standard. And so there's a conflict and a contradiction in the worldview, and that's what apologetics does on a big, broad scale. It defends Christianity, and it says our worldview is correct. All these other worldviews are incorrect, and we want to help you to understand that and bring you over to our point of view. Did you know that the study of apologetics is actually commanded in Scripture? How many of y'all knew that? knew that apologetics was commanded in Scripture. Great. It's two people. So, I'm, 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 I'm glad to hear that. 1 Peter 3.15 <laughs> Peter 3.15 tells us, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And I want you to notice always being prepared to make a defense. That English word we use as defense comes from the Greek word apologia. When Peter wrote that, Peter wrote an apologia. Always being prepared to make an apologia to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope. And it's that Greek word apologia that we get our word apologetics from. And so apologetics doesn't mean we apologize for being Christians. We're not embarrassed or ashamed about anything. We don't have to apologize for it. Maybe we have to apologize for some of our behaviors over the centuries, but we don't apologize for Christianity. But that comes from apologetics, which means defense. So if we're to prepare a defense, then we're going to prepare an apologia. And Scripture tells us that that's exactly what we're supposed to do, is to prepare that defense. But there's more to it than just preparing a defense. Studying apologetics helps us deepen our knowledge about God, which increases our love for God. And it also helps us in our evangelistic efforts out in the community. It helps us have answers for questions that people have in the community that we're often faced with. And sometimes that defense out in the world can be very, very challenging. I mentioned briefly several months ago, sometime last year I believe, that several years ago I had an opportunity to interview an atheist as part of a class I was taking. And we'll call this person Michael, and we're going to refer to Michael all throughout this series. Michael is our target, basically. And, I, and Michael was a skeptic of many aspects of the Christian faith. He was particularly a skeptic about the Bible. And so the assignment was I was to ask this person one question, 
And they had a specific question, but I was to ask them one question, and I wasn't to refute them. I wasn't to, to have any comeback. I was just let them talk, record the answer, and that was the end of the interview. And so it was just a real simple thing. So here's the one question. Do you think the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Y'all are going to have to speak up. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Do you think the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Pretty straightforward question. And this is the answer. I don't think it was. I think inspiration comes in many forms like artists who write songs because of inspiration. I think the Bible could be written in the same way just like any book, song, or other art. But I think it is in some ways art because it's a creation of man but it's also handpicked in certain ways because it's gone through different interpretations. But I want you to notice some key words. Creation of man. Handpicked. And different interpretations. And these are not uncommon. You're running believe the authority of the Bible. And so you look at that and you say, all right, so where do I start with this person? How do I begin a conversation with this person? You know, how do we, how does this person answer the big three questions? Probably quite a bit different than the way that I do. This is Michael's response and Michael has a dilemma. You see, Michael has a dilemma because Michael doesn't know the truth. And because Michael doesn't know the truth, his entire worldview is false. He's not even living in reality. Because his worldview is false. That makes for a very serious dilemma. Now, I hope you keep Michael in your mind as we move through this and Michael's dilemma. Because this is the exact type of person that we're to keep in our mind. This is the person we're building our defense for. Primarily, it's for our own good as well. But primarily, this is the this is the person that we're looking for, Michael and his dilemma. And if you look at the back of this section, I've put a copy of Michael's dilemma, so you can refer to it. it's the back of the, the tab. And I've left the tabs unlabeled. You can mark the label, the tabs however you want to. But at the very back of this this first tab, this first section, I've printed a, a big copy of. Of that Michael's dilemma, so you can refer back to that. That's that's the idea of the person. How do we address this person? How do we approach this person? And so this class is structured around approaching a person that has that particular disposition. So as I said, as Great Commission Christians, how do we approach Michael? You know, if we go to him and we say, Michael. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells me that all, all of Scripture is God-breathed. It's breathed out by God. More than likely, he comes back and he says, that's just man's book. It doesn't mean anything to me. You can go back and argue with something else from Scripture and we'll get the same answer over and over again. And we get accused of arguing in a circle. That's called circular reasoning or begging the question. You've heard the term before, begging the question. That's what that's called. And so there ends up being a problem with this. And the problem starts off and it runs like this. We say God exists. We're saying this to an unbeliever. We say God exists. And they say, how do you know this? And we know. And so we come back and we say, we know it because the Bible says that God exists. And then he comes back and he says, why do you believe the Bible? Why do I believe the Bible? Well, that's because it's God's Word. And God's Word tells me that God exists. You see, that's how we argue when we have just the Bible to argue with people like Michael. 
we end up in a circle. And like I said, this is in philosophy, this is considered a, a illegitimate arg argument. It's an illogical argument, and it has a, a, a name. Uh, Circulus in probando is what it's called for arguing in a circle. So what do we do now? Where do we go from here with people like Michael? We have to come up with a defense. We have to come up with a way to approach them somehow to start somewhere other than the Bible. We have to take a first step and start somewhere outside of the Bible. Now, I know this makes some of you uncomfortable, and I understand that. Truly, I do. It took me a while to kind of get my mind around it as well. But with some people, you can't even start the conversation unless you take one step outside of the Bible to begin the conversation, to find some common ground. And then from that common ground, you start to build and build and build and build. You know, this younger generation is a prove-it-to-me generation. Show me. Prove it to me. They can get on the phone and pull up more information in five minutes than we could look up in five weeks. Prove it to me. Give me some facts. Give me some evidence. I'm not just going to blindly believe it. And so we have to find some place to start with that. The beautiful thing is that God's perfect, right? And God has found a way to do that. This is not man. God's already done all this. We just had to discover it on our own. God's revealed Himself to mankind in two different ways, two large general categories in which He's revealed Himself to us. He's revealed Himself to us through creation and what we see in nature, and that's called general revelation, or sometimes it's called the light of nature. And from that, natural theology comes. And God has also revealed Himself to us in Holy Scripture, which includes His revelation of Jesus Christ, but He's real, revealed Himself to us through Holy Scripture. And so we have two revelations of God. He's talked to us through nature, and He's talked to us through the Bible. Paul talks about natural theology or the light of nature or general revelation, whatever you want to term it. He talks about that in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through 20, and it goes on a little further from there. And we'll cover this in detail. I've got the great honor and privilege to preach both sermons next Sunday. And the first sermon in the morning, we'll dig deeper into Romans 1, and we'll, we'll look at, at it deeper. And then the evening service is, is about Paul's idea of philosophy. So those are a couple of good sermons. I'd encourage you to, to meet those. But, but here Paul lays the groundwork for natural theology or for what we can learn about nature. And here Paul writes, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, they're without excuse. Paul is pretty direct and he's pretty plain. I love that passage, but there's something, there's lots of things that are really important in there, but he says, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So I think about the moon and the stars and the rocks and the plants and you know, all the animals and everything, even humans, I think about those things. We can see God in all of those things. We can see God in the sunrise and the sunset everywhere we see. But we seldom think about the gift of our mind. The capacity that we have to reason, to communicate, that is a gift from God. God wouldn't have gifted us with a mind greater than He expected us to use and after the fall our mind is not as sharp as it once was so we're we're a dumb shadow of what we were in the garden of eden but one of the most wonderful things that god has given all of us regardless of our capacity is a mind every single person in this room knows something that nobody else in this room knows everybody in this room is an expert at something Everyone has a beautiful mind 
created by God and gifted to them. And that is a created thing that God has given us. And so by that created mind that He has given us, He certainly expects us to use it. <clears throat> Paul is telling us that as we build our defense that we need to use that. We need to use our mind and we can use our reason to prepare our defense for God and for Christianity and we can use the things that God created in the world, the natural things. Those things testify to the existence of God. We should embrace those things and we should defend those things in the Christian, in the Christian faith. Apologetics is an interesting field and it became very, very fascinating to me. I've got a, a rich science background. I spent 34 years working as an engineer, scientist, whatever you want to call it. And so my, my, my heart and my, my whole life was, was in science. And so apologetics just melded together with that really well. And so I, I enjoy apologetics. Apologetics is cool. And I like to hear little cool things that, about apologetics, and I'm a, I'm a geek, so. <laughs> but but a lot of the time we just hear we just hear a story, you know, or we hear one piece. And how else are you going to learn it, right? It's not like you can sit and listen to a lecture for well, six years like I've been doing. You know, you can't do that. So you get pieces of the story along as you go, and and. Sometimes it's hard to take those pieces and to put them all together and to make a story. You know, we get a piece from archaeology over here and a, a piece from history over here and something from Plato over here. And how does all that stuff fit together? It becomes kind of disjointed. And, and when you do that, you're forcing every argument to stand on its own because it's not tied in in a cohesive story. Statistically, it's got a 50-50 chance of being right or wrong, right? So when you when you present one single <laughs> argument and you say this is it, you can only make two decisions, either yes or no. That means the probability is 50%. How do you ever get past a yes or no, 50-50, whatever? I mean, you want to get to some point where you say, you know, it's, it's not 50-50. It's like 90-10 or 95-5 or 98-2 or whatever. The way to do that, the best way to do that is to my opinion, is to teach apologetics in a cumulative case fashion, where you start out at a beginning point, and then you methodically work through all the different arguments, each argument tied together, each argument building upon itself, strengthening itself, putting an argument together for the Michaels of the world to help them with their dilemma, and at the same time to strengthen our own faith and our own belief and to learn more about God. And so a cumulative case does that, and that's what we're going to do in here. These graphics, I hope, are starting to make sense now from some of the stuff that you've seen in the class. So those are, those are slides and excerpts and different things from the start of this class, Does God Exist? And you see the ellipse, we're going to move down each each lesson that we learn, there'll be more graphics and we're going to methodically move in a cumulative case around the room and we're going to end up that God does exist at the end of the class. So it's a methodical, cumulative case. <coughs> now as we go through this, I want you to think about a, a, a court, a jury court or a trial. When you know, someone goes to trial, they present an opening argument. The defense does. That's Christians. That would be us in apology. We, we present an opening argument. And then the atheist presents their opening argument. And then the rest of the trial is adding data and evidence and data and evidence all pointing to the same opening statement. We say God exists. And everything we present in a cumulative case fashion says, yes, God exists. This is evidence one. This is evidence two. This is evidence three. And we work through a cumulative case and tie it all together. And we pull from philosophy and history and science. And we eventually get to a point, like I said, 10 weeks down the road, to where we look at the authority of Scripture and then what Scripture says, and then we're, we're off and on our way. So, to give you an idea, a roadmap of where we're going, 
you remember our question, our, our circular argument. It starts off with the question, does God exist? And we answer, and they say, how do you know this? So see, it seems the same. But we take a different approach. We have to find common ground, something that the atheist and the Christian can agree on, some kind of common ground. And so we start and we say, uh-oh. We say we know that God exists because we can go through an argument from cosmology. I need two minutes. And that leads to an argument from design, the design that we see in the world. Argument from our minds, I've already touched upon that. One aspect of our minds is this morality that we have that no other animals have. And then all of these things from creation make you wonder, wouldn't the Creator want to talk to you? There's a man in history that they say was the Son of God. He came, he, was di he died, he was crucified. They say that he rose again in history. And what that man, Jesus, said is he affirmed Scripture. He affirmed that it was truthful. And what does Scripture say? Scripture says that God exists. That's the outline of where we're going. And if those of you, y'all are taking notes, it's on the board over there if you want to check it later. But that's, that's the roadmap. That's the direction we're going. And so we'll pick up next week. I appreciate your time. I hope you're as excited as I am. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, next week we'll have a, a new set of inserts. A new we'll start our first argument. This was just an introduction, so we'll first start our first argument and we'll build on it from there. So thank you all so much for this opportunity.